watercolors for me is um, similar to acrylics and vice versa. Watercolors are not permanent, but we have staining colors. So a lot of the phthalos and the, the Grumbachers uh, colors are staining colors. And um, we're also transparent. So when you want the colors to flow, let's see, then um, I use the transparent colors. And when I start a painting, I can either work on dry or work wet paper. And as I paint and do try new things, I keep a lot of notes. Well, this is my, one of my notes. <clears throat> this is my palette of seven colors. And I, my favorite paints are the Winsor Newton colors. And um, the nice thing about watercolors is because they can be re-dissolved. Let me see if I have one. Okay, I brought some samples that I will show you how you can embellish your watercolors to actually make them look better by adding collage to them. A lot of my work is experimental, so I, I, I will start doing um, like um, warm-up uh, paintings. <clears throat> Sometimes I prepare the background first. This is just a wet into wet background, and then saran wrap was laid on top of this. Okay. So once that is dry, and I work on a tilted surface, then I can actually start painting uh, on a dry surface. And you see how flat this is? It's not warped, the paper. If you wet the paper both sides and paint it wet into wet and then let it dry on a breathable surface like paper towels or a piece of carpet, it dries flat. It doesn't mm -hmm. ripple. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I go back in and paint directly onto this. So um, the subject tonight is going to be poppies. And when I work with poppies, I work with all my reds. So that's permanent rose, which is more, uh, cool, and winter red, which is warm. And then my yellow, which is New Gamboge, and that is the warm yellow. The cool yellow is winter yellow. So with the warm red and the um, warm yellow, I work with my poppies with the cool yellow and the cool blue is my green. You put water on what? What is that white thing there? This. Palette? Yeah, oh, it's a rubber palette. There's no paper or anything there. Uh -huh. So um, you, just, you can use paper you just clay. Get wet. You can use a virtue tray. This is a John Pike palette and it's plastic. Okay. I'm going to get that ready. Now, when I want to go darker, these are fairly transparent colors. When I want to go darker, I add burnt sienna. And for this seven color palette, burnt sienna is considered the magic color because uh, you can get down to a tone of color, taking it from the pure to a tone. I'm going to reactivate the colors again with a mist of water. And I only use distilled water into the mister. And that keeps everything not contaminated. Hmm? Well, you never know what's in your water. I don't even drink water out of the tap. <laughs> okay, so here we go. I have to see the invisible flower so I can paint it. Okay. Now, because this is on a, on a um, tilted surface, the colors will run downhill. We work with the board away from you. <clears throat> when I'm painting at home, uh -huh. 
uh, usually towards me, but okay. I'm, paint, I'm painting upside down for you. Okay, I just wondered if that was your pet neighbor if you were doing that. Sometimes I can paint better upside down because I'm so used to it. <laughs> I can paint better with the lights out. <laughs> okay, now I'm getting a little bit into green and letting that red follow into the green. Okay, this is paint on the bottom and water in the middle joining the two together, and paint follows its own path of wetness. So what I get is dark at the bottom, dark at the top, and transparent in the middle, which gives you a change in value as well as color, and makes for a more entertaining stem. Do a couple of those. Now I don't mix, I do not pre-mix <coughs> pre my colors. <clears throat> and so the reason for that is I want to be surprised at what I get. <laughs> if I pre-mix them, then I've determined where, what colors they were going to be. So I just mix the colors <coughs> as, as I go. What paper do you use? This is 140 uh, arches. And you know the rule of thumb is you rinse your brush after every every time you get into your paints. Okay. Now at a certain point. The, the paint goes from gloss to satin. At that point, I can actually scrape into this for texture, or I can lift with a damp angle shader and actually lift lights back out. Okay, I see a drop. I got some drops here. And to get rid of that, I just take a damp brush. If I take a damp brush into a wet puddle, this is wetter than this, and I can actually make the paint go back into the brush. That gets rid of the puddle without dabbing the paint. Okay. And then for my violet. For the violet, I'm using uh, French ultramarine blue and uh, permanent rose. So I'm using my my cool red and my warm blue to get the violet. And the center of the poppy is dark, so violet is our darkest color. that another minute or two and then I can do some scraping and lifting down here. In the meantime, I'll get back into my greens. And working on the chisel. I can put in the, the leaves. Now when I'm at home, I experiment with several sheets of paper when I'm trying for a new technique. So um, I try to think outside the box. That keeps me uh, alerted of the possibilities and the surprises that are available through painting and discovering new things. What size brush is that you're using? This is a half inch flat. Now all my brushes are synthetic. synthetic. 
So it's a um, sableine, but it's uh, synthetic. I'll put a blue leaf. If you know there's a poppy leaf, I don't have to tell you it's green, right? Now some scraping, and you can either scrape with the bottom of the chisel edge brush, and if the paint is real wet, when I scrape this will become dark. If the paint is almost dry, then it will scrape a white back to the white of the paper. And I'm going to do some lifts. So we call the scraping valleys. We call the lifts hills. So if you have your scraping for the valleys and your lifts for the hills, it gives you this feeling of a movement in the, in the panel. And whenever you have a value change, you'll have a dimensional change. So now we get into this. And when I, whenever I'm working, I try to try to include all five values in the painting. So the more the more value changes, the more dimensional it's going to look. So I leave white. I paint in mid tones. Then I add my darks. And with watercolors, your darks are the um, the last things you add to the. Blue. The darks are the last thing you add to the painting. Scraping some lights. I have another dimensional change here. Let's see. Maybe a lift here in the middle where it went too dark. This will be your um, door prize. Actually, you'll have two of them. Okay? 10-4 over there. Amy? Amy. <laughs> yes, tell us One for the photographer. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, now I'm going for a really dark violet. So I use French aquamarine blue, permanent rose, and add a little bit of burnt sienna to that. Or what's the other thing I can add to violet to make it go a little bit grayer? Yeah. Color wheel. What, what's the opposite of violet? Yellow. Yeah. So if I add yellow to violet, it'll tone it down and make it more um, grayish. <clears throat> now I'm going to put the uh, stamen on the poppy. I do that by spattering. And this is the darkest dark. Okay. Now I'll show you on this one, on the back of this one. This is what I have my students practice. Okay? This is fun. I, this is a challenge. Okay. If you see a circle this big, Circle this big and circle this big. Now, your challenge is to get all your spatters in that circle. <laughs> you want to see? Yeah. Okay, this is, this is the dagger striker brush. It's a little bit on the wimpy side. Now, when you master the, the silver dollar size, 
Then you go to the quarter size. Okay. This is entertainment. <laughs> I'll tell you how I would do it. I would cut out a hole in the paper the size of the dollar. And you can do that too. Over there yeah. and then okay, here we go. This is smaller than a dime. Okay, now this is what I'm going to show you. Now you see how the many different, there's more variety of greens here, but there's more yellow. Okay. I, I did this without talking to an audience. <laughs> but I can make this more entertaining because it's not too late to add more of a yellow green to this one. Okay, so we go back and I think warm thoughts. So go to more yellow. Now the real poppy leaf is more of an olive. It's not very pretty. And it's real quickly. Okay, let's put one back here. So always put the center vein in first. And then this. Okay, I'm still going to have to um, scrape to bring in another value there. Down here I'm going to add a leaf, but it's going to be pure blue. So it's going to be pure uh, Antwerp. Now I'm going to work from the center out and make kind of a um, rough looking. And you notice this doesn't have a chisel edge, but I can still scrape with it because it's got a point on it. What color was your background? What color blue? Uh, that was Antwerp. Antwerp? Mm -hmm. It's the same as Thalo. Or um, Prussian. Or Grumbacher blue. Okay, now I'm going to get a little bit more dimension on my leaves at the base. So I'm thinking heavy bottoms. And I'll just go back with uh, Antwerp blue and burnt sienna which will give me a darker green. And by putting a darker green at the bottom here where it's still wet, it will bleed back into the leaf, but also add, because it's a value chain, it will create a dimensional change. Heavy bottoms. So, what kind of brush you said that is? dagger striper. A dagger? Dagger. D okay. <laughs> okay. So the fact that this is what I like to sign my name with is the dagger striper. So I'm going to go vertical on this one. Okay. Probably vertical on that one. Now the rule of thumb haven't heard this before, is your signature should be one shade darker than the surface you're putting it on. That way it doesn't dominate the painting. And you just say it should be the same color as the background. So, okay. Now, I'll show you a couple finished pieces. Can you, everyone see this without the glare? Okay. This is pure watercolor, so I'd like you to enjoy this painting. Just look at it. You can see the background is done wet and wet. The flower is done with gray washes. Are there layers of wash on this, mm -hmm. on that flower? Yeah. Okay, here's another watercolor. It's just pure watercolor. There's nothing fancy. It's just a little bit more, I'm more focused on variety of shades of green. Okay, I'll start that one over here. So the first two paintings are pure watercolor. Okay. Get ready for. 
for some excitement. <laughs> the last three have collage in them. Okay, this one is just a little bit of a surgical gauze or cheesecloth. And it's painted with the same colors as the flower. You place that on there and lift it off, or you left it? No, it's on there. Oh, okay. Okay, now whenever I add collage to a painting, do you use uh, glaze to get it to stay I use, on? I use the um, golden uh, mat. Mat? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Heavy so, gel mat. Oh, gel. Or, or gel medium. Okay, so the, the actual gauze is painted with the same paints. So it, it, there's color harmony. It adds a little bit more dimension because it's another layer. The darker blue down here, is that a, again, how many? No, okay, so with watercolor, the darker the color you want, the less water is in it. Less water. The lighter you want it, the more water is in it. We call that dilute. Here's one. Do you use that gel because it dries, uh, it doesn't dry shiny? There's a matte gel and there's a gloss gel. And that would be shiny. Yes, yep. gloss is shiny. Okay, now in this one, uh, it's a wet and wet background, and you almost have to feel it. What I did was I painted the leaves on another surface. Then I tore them out. And then I glued them on. Okay. There's a paper called um, Masa. It's M-A-S-A. -S -A. I thought I had some scrap paper in here, but I don't see it. So I'll explain it to you. It's a uh, like a sumi rice paper. And what you do is you just go like this. It's white. Pretend it's white. Use your imagination. You throw it in the water. Okay? Then you squeeze all the water out. In the process of wrinkling the paper, it destroys the surface. Now you paint on it. Spread it out, and you paint on it. Then you end up with something like this. But the back is just as beautiful as the front. Okay, so I'll go through and I'll paint different masa papers, okay, different colors of masa because I like the texture and I love texture. It's almost okay. like a rice paper, isn't it? It is. It's, it's what they do semi painting on. Okay, so we have the masa paper. <clears throat> you can offer, there's another rice paper called um, Thai Unryu. And it's a uh, fibrous, can you see the fibers? Mm -hmm. This was white, and I painted it a light green. Okay, so when I'm getting ready to do some collage, I'll work with numerous different rice papers with different colors, all in the same family. Okay, this is another one. Rice paper, tie and Ryu. Now the reason why I'm telling you it's Thai and Ryu, like Thailand, is uh, it, it has the fibers. If you just ordered Unryu, it would have one or two fibers in it, but it wouldn't have all, all these fibers. And the fibers make the paper tough. How do you spell Ryu? U-N-R-Y-U. And you can get that at Artmark, Big Mix. Now, here's another interesting fact. If you took a sheet of white watercolor paper, pretend this is white, and you put a piece of Thai and Ryu on top of the watercolor paper, then paint in it. Now you have green paper, and you get this underneath. So we call this a two for one. Okay? Now I have a piece of watercolor paper that's this color and a piece of tie and Ryu that's this color. But they were once married, okay? So they are together, and then they're apart, 
and they are still in the same color family. And what you do in watercolor, you can do in acrylic. So if you're an acrylic painter and you decide to go with this technique, you need to water down your um, watercolors to a dilute consistency so that, and then remove the papers while they're still wet so they don't stick together. Otherwise, acrylic will act like a glue. Okay. Okay, so now I have some choices in my collage papers. And they all go together because it came part out of the same system of colors. Okay? The seven color palette. Okay. Now, I painted some poppies. More. When I work on a series, they can go up to 30 paintings of various sizes. <coughs> okay. So, what I did on this one was I took the, the masa paper and cut out this leaf. Okay? I took the Thai Unryu and cut out this leaf. So here I have a textured leaf and I have a fuzzy leaf. So you see how much variety is in that? Same colors, the only difference is the type of paper. So the poppy is painted on 140-pound arches. Then we have the masa and then the tie and red. And I'm going to pass this around. It's basically the same palette, different papers. It's your turn. I decided to cut out the whole poppy out. Okay? and put it on a piece of masa paper. So this is done on watercolor paper. Cut, 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 cut. This is masa. So what I have here is something similar to this. Watercolor paper. <laughs> paper dolls. They have their own little case. Okay? If you can't find the cutter bead, just get the small <coughs> titanium scissors. They run about seven or eight dollars in the craft store. You and they're it. extremely sharp. Did you say cutter beam? Bean. Bumblebee. Oh, okay. Beans. Cutter beans. beans. Okay. So now when I get ready to collage, here's my dilemma. I say Okay, I don't want to make a mistake on the background, so I'm going to make several backgrounds, and then I'm going to make my decision. So I cut it on this. Okay, so it's relative as to what somebody likes. I could go dark green, yellow, a, a tone of red. Let's try this. That's more serious, more masculine looking, but yet it still has the filigree in it. Okay. Now, this is watercolor paper. To give this stability, I glued the masa paper on top of watercolor paper so I have firmness. Otherwise, it'd be flimsy. Okay? You glued that mat. Yeah, okay. the gel medium. Yeah. And I think I like this the best. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. This is how I think out loud. And then if I try something new for the first time, it's right on this paper. Then I have this for my record. Okay? A lot of work. <laughs> now, if you are passionate about something, you put the extra effort into it. If you're passionate about um, boats, you did the same thing. Boat after boat after boat, or dogs, or cats, or whatever. If, you have, if you're passionate about a certain subject matter, you'll go to no end to get as many varieties and whatever of that subject. So I'll pass this around. Now here's an example of a collage. 
that I painted. This is my daughter, Jill. And she was painted on a totally different surface. And I wasn't happy with what I did to the background. You know, sometimes we make mistakes. I, I tore her and I cut, cut her. Okay, this is her friend, Amy. And I, again, I think when I started doing Amy, I decided I wanted more variety with her. And so I deliberately painted a background using the same colors that I used with Amy. Then I cut Amy out and then attached her to the appropriate background and then added back the, the gauze for, I call this vintage ballerina. Okay, here's a simple poppy and I just used rice paper called Cherie, C-H-I-R-I, -I, and it's, um, it's a um, mulberry paper with, with uh, bark in it. So it's, it's simple, but it's interesting. It has texture without you're going overboard. Now, this is done on 300 pound paper. It was a very simple poppy painting similar to this, okay, like this, no figure in it, all right, and I looked at it and looked at it and looked at it, I said, this needs something, it needs, uh, it needs to tell a story, so what I did was, I painted Jill, my daughter, and um, I had her model for me, so she's stooping over and she was doing this, and I photographed her. Then I painted her picture, and then I cut her out in pieces. So, um, this is her, and then I had to, this was in the way, so I had to tear her arm and put her underneath the pad. Okay, so she would go through. And you know with, with another thing to add dimension is overlap mm -hmm. in a picture. Now, I kind of liked that and it was doing okay, but I needed more. And I said, well, what does it need? <laughs> hmm. So, I said to myself, well, it needs more fern leaves. It's got enough poppies. Hmm. So I painted more fern leaves, cut them out. Now, if you can believe this, this piece right here is collage. I use the same wet into wet technique, and it looks just like this that's on the watercolor paper, except this is collage, and this is painted on the paper. This is collage. But I tucked it in to what was going on here, and I had to feel it myself now. This is collage here. This is collage here. This is collage here. And then this is collage, and I only, only glue down the center mm -hmm. so that when it's in the frame, it casts a shadow. Any questions? Cool. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So think about that. Think about taking what you're doing now. Can you do that with canvas? Yes. You can. Do you paint on the uh, water? Do you paint on paint canvas or mm -hmm. with watercolor? I with acrylic. As in, and I also have some watercolor. Um, Actually, watercolor canvases. They use absorbent ground on the canvas. Is that an ampersand uh, that they use for No, it's, it's actually a stretched canvas stretched with absorbent canvas. ground, and it's called watercolor canvas. Okay. And I think the first ones I bought were at Michael's, but I think now it's Dick Foot has them. Yeah. You 
very comfortable. Do you think they will soon accept those in charge? Say again. Do you think they will soon accept watercolor canvas in shows? Missouri watercolor already does. Missouri watercolor doesn't have to have a vice on it. It's water medium canvas. So even if it's watercolor or, or acrylic, they accept it on canvas without glass. In Missouri okay. watercolor is the vice. What they say in their in their uh not St. Louis, Missouri. I know, but they say in their prospective, they wrote no canvases. Just canvas. Well, that's a new rule. For the first 20 years, it was uh, uh, canvases were accepted because I've been in shows where it was. I have to, I have to ask Go online and see. Go, on, go online and see. Or did. You would have read that. Too many curious hands. Yeah. <laughs> but if you paint watercolor on canvas mm -hmm. and you don't put a glass on it. If I have a doubt, I, I will call the director before I enter it into a show. But if you're going to sell that Sherwin and you don't put a glass on it. Oh, would, okay. I see where you're, oh, you're coming from. Okay. When you finish painting the watercolor on canvas, you spray fixative on it. Okay. Okay. Right. You do put a, a varnish over it. Varnish. Uh, an acrylic varnish. Ooh. Other than the years of experience that are behind this, a typical question I'm sure you get, how many hours do you think you put into a painting like that? <laughs> I mean, it has to be uh, a, yeah. a humongous. Yeah, actual hours. Well, a lot of people say, well, it took me 20 years to paint that painting. Right. Well, that's why I was qualifying. <laughs> but actually, I probably have at least 50 paintings or 100 in process. Okay. okay. Ongoing? Yes. Whoa. I have three flat vials full of unfinished paintings. Um, when I don't know what to do with a painting, it goes in the file. And I wait until, give it some time and distance, then go back to it, pull it out, and say, I know just what to do. That's how this one started. I may have started this 20 years ago. And I said, you know, that's too good of a painting to throw away. I don't throw any of my paintings away. Maybe later when I get more experience, I'll know what I want. Well, then I pulled it out 10 years later. Because I needed, I wanted to put, I like that painting. It just wasn't finished. And that's when I decided to put my daughter's figure in it. And then it tells a story. So... You know, just because, can you can you do it in one sitting? You know, no, not really. And, I, 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 and you know, like what I did tonight, that was easy. Those are spontaneity pieces. Um, but, um. Shirley, what is the gold that you're putting on? I use gold spray paint. Gold spray paint. Is it? Is it watercolor? Is it, uh, no, it's, it's a. What brand is that we get at Lowe's? <laughs> oh, okay. Whatever. See, this is all. This is all painted very, you know, quickly, and then this is what adds to a change in the background. Just a gentle decorative piece. You like it? Yes. Would you hang out in your living room? I like your movement in all of your flowers. <laughs> well, it needs a background, I think. You do? More color. <laughs> well, sometimes you just want a gentle piece. Could you get away with this gold spray and, and, and Moe's? Mm -hmm. This is a small percentage. You're very skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wonder if Dave knows what to accept it. Well, it's less than 10%. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> it's a very small percentage. Well, I think Any other questions? Use, you will use that as a background for something? Uh-huh. That's pretty just like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I don't know what I'm saying. It doesn't look very much on there. But you see, uh, 
Yes, he does. That's just all relatives. I know it's finished when I say it's finished. You may say, well, and, and I say also, a painting isn't finished until it's sold. Until it's what? Sold. Oh. So if, that, if you want to buy that painting, <clears throat> then it's finished. <laughs> Well, that, that gets it out of my sight and out of my mind. So that means I've got a lot of unfinished paintings. <laughs> That's another way of looking at it. Okay. Well, thank you for having me here tonight. And now we're going to have a drawing for the drawing. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Focused in North St. Louis County, Northside Art Association is a nonprofit 501c3 arts organization that serves local artists through community exposure, networking, education, and peer interaction. Learn more about Northside Art Association at www.northsideartassociation.org.